So our topic today is Grand Falloons and Pseudo Community. And welcome also to those of you who are joining us later on video. We have focused this month on beloved community. That is what makes for the kind of connections that unite people who are different so that we are all included, all equally important. But such groups don't yet exist, especially on large scales or very often. Instead, there are many groups which seem to meet our needs for connection, but which fall far short of the ideal of a beloved community. Some of these appear to be communities, but there is no genuine connection, no depth of relationship. Others are coercive, using fear, guilt, and shame to create conformity. In both extremes, I believe, looking at the dynamics of false community can help us to recognize and build towards authentic community. So I'll start first with Grand Falloons. This is a word I love, a word first introduced by Kurt Vonnegut in his 1963 novel, Cat's Cradle. Uh, a Grand Falloon is a group of people who seem to share a common identity or purpose but their mutual association is actually pretty meaningless. Vonnegut later defined it as, quote, a proud and meaningless association of human beings, unquote. And he included such groups as the Daughters of the American Revolution and people who work for the General Electric Company or Hoosiers, of whom he was one. Now, I used to live in the Midwest, not in Indiana, but next door. And so I'm familiar with Hoosiers. Anyone living or born in Indiana is a Hoosier. Vonnegut describes an encounter in his novel. He writes, my God, she said, are you a Hoosier? I admitted I was. I'm a Hoosier too, she crowed. Nobody has to be ashamed of being a Hoosier. I'm not, I said, I never knew anybody who was. And that's a Hoosier. <laughs> The daughters of the American Revolution have nothing in common, really, except that an ancestor served on the American side during the Revolutionary War. And that's really quite a loose connection many generations later. It says nothing about personality, purpose, values. And yet people spend a lot of time documenting their genealogy in order to be able to prove their eligibility to belong to that group. So what is it that motivates people to identify as a Hoosier or a daughter of the American Revolution? I think it's our perceived need to find something in common with someone else in order to connect. Some research by social psychologists has shown how easy it is to get people to identify with their group based on even trivial criteria, even in created situations people then focus on and exaggerate their similarities with those within the group. And they also focus on and exaggerate their differences with those outside the group. Robert Sapolsky, a neurological sciences researcher, suggests that it's built into our brains to divide the world into us and them. In a 2017 article, which you can find online under the title, Why Your Brain Hates Other People, he uses an expression that others before him have also observed. There are two kinds of people in the world, those who divide the world into two kinds of people and those who don't. He suggests that belonging to an in-group is hardwired into us so when we don't have an authentic community to belong to, we seek out grand falloons. I think here too of the so-called atheist community. There are a few things in common, um, like not believing in any gods. Um, within that grouping, some believe that belief in gods is dangerous or stupid, while others might say to each their own. Most realize that being an atheist in the USA is still to be an untrusted minority member. And so atheists might share an irritation or annoyance or worse with public rituals that assume that everyone believes in a God. 
Uh, I spent a couple of years moderating an atheist forum online, um, eh, but more than 20 years ago. The in-groupness was just really um, reinforced when enthusiastic Christians who took very seriously their commandment to evangelize people would sign into the forum to tell us about God as if we had never thought about gods before. And when the then president was quoted by a noble, notable atheist in a quote, which I have to say can't be confirmed, he was quoted as saying, I don't know that atheists should be regarded as citizens, nor should they be regarded as patriotic. This is one nation under God. Well, that outside um, antagonism built some bonds among those who were seemingly attacked. Um, and, you know, it's likely that that president didn't say exactly that. But it's also true that atheists are regarded, according to polls, as untrustworthy, uh, way at the bottom of all different groups when being considered as candidates for public office. But the so-called atheist community has many serious differences within it. One of the biggest is between those who are more strident about their atheism and who often denounce those within the ranks who they call social justice warriors. Many I know who used to identify as atheists do not do so any longer. And in fact, if you carefully pick apart some Pew research on how people identify religiously, it turns out that of Americans who don't believe in any kind of a higher power or God, only about one sixth of those people call themselves atheists. Well, the atheist community is, I would contend, a grand falloon. Even most who are supposedly within that community are quick to do an us them twist dividing who they think are the good atheists and who they think are the bad atheists. Oh, well, even our extended family can sometimes be a grand falloon as an exaggerated version of that. Uh, many of you know I'm interested in genealogy. This last week, the largest genealogy conference in the world went online. It was virtual and free, and more than half a million people signed up for it. One thing you could do is if you had identified yourself on a family tree at a certain website, you could find out who among others attending in that half a million people uh, were related to you. And I discovered that there were more than 600 such relatives attending, but most were in the eighth to 10th cousin range, which is really very trivial. Yes, we might briefly cooperate on research on our seven times great grandparents, but a connection that really comes from other factors. I've been working right now with a third cousin once removed to help her solve a mystery of her grandfather's adoption. In addition to being related more closely to her grandmother through Norwegian relatives, it turns out I'm distantly related to her grandfather who was adopted through my Swedish relatives. But we aren't really a community. We come and go. Other family members I've discovered online, we have connected more deeply, more of a sense of family, of connection, often because we have common values. But most of them are a grand falloon. Grand balloons are one kind of group identity that might feel like community, but really isn't. Another kind is called pseudo community. When I was teaching at the Lay Leadership Summer School for about 14 years, one of the topics that was illustrated over and over was the well-researched evidence that effective groups go through certain stages. One way of naming those stages is this, forming, storming, norming, and performing. Any group when it starts, whether it's a book group or a committee, is at first a kind of grand falloon. You're there because you're there with at least some tentative commitment to a common purpose, uh, but you haven't really bonded. And in the forming stage, groups tend to be very polite and considerate of each other. And at the same time, people are unsure and aren't fully committed. Often at that stage, if there's a conflict in the group, people easily leave. It's just not comfortable any longer. 
or the group will move to mollify that one person who's not comfortable to make them happy. I think here of a startup ethical society I knew of, actually this happened almost exactly the same way in two different cities with different groups of people. A small group formed and they were very enthusiastic about becoming an ethical society. They met often and they became very friendly and civil and cooperative. Uh, but then in moving ahead, some decisions had to be made about the group's identity. One or two members in each of those cases felt that the definition excluded them and they threatened to leave. The rest of the group, though they disagreed, didn't want to lose anybody. So they agreed instead not to make that decision about their identity and to remain a more loosely defined group which agreed to disagree. And I have to say without that core identity, the two groups failed to gel as ethical societies. More importantly, they failed to gel as communities that could last because they didn't resolve their differences creatively or make a choice. Neither of those groups existed for very long. Groups which go through the forming stage and begin to storm, that is to have some disagreements, have two choices. They can return to the forming stage, a stage which M. Scott Peck names pseudo-community, in which civility and peace are prioritized over confronting differences. It's kind of a niceness society. Or they can move through storming. Sometimes that means, as with the atheist community, that some people leave, finding a different identity elsewhere is more important. And other times it means finding creative solutions. As has ethical culture with an identity of solidarity in the deed, diversity in the creed. Real community understands that difference is real and valuable. There are boundaries to groups as well, or they don't gel as community. There is conflict in groups as there is in any relationship between human beings. And if that conflict isn't managed and moved through rather than avoided, the people and the relationships won't grow and deepen. After facing storming or what Scott Peck names chaos, groups then begin to gel in a norming stage where the group defines itself more fully. A group doesn't get to performing in the case of a committee, it's doing its job well, or a book group that satisfies those in it, or a group forming a new ethical society, it doesn't really get there until it goes through those other stages. And then most groups repeat the cycle. Just when you think you are performing and happy, there's another conflict, people being different from each other, really. And the choice is whether to avoid that conflict and be a kind of pseudo community or to take it on, try to resolve it creatively, sometimes defining appropriate boundaries to behavior and norms, and then getting to a new stage of more an authentic community. I remember years ago teaching a workshop within a group that was having some problems figuring out how to handle their conflict. I asked as an exercise that people think about how their families handled conflict. It turned out almost everyone in that room from that group that was having trouble handling conflict described one of two family patterns. Either there was a lot of conflict in their family and their reaction was literally or figuratively to dive behind the sofa and pretend it wasn't happening. Or the second pattern, their parents smiled, denied that there was any conflict. If a child asserted some disagreement, the parents would reassure them that they really didn't think that. Families as pseudo community help prepare some people to have difficulty moving beyond pseudo community in their adult lives. And then while I didn't include this kind of group in the title of this talk, there's another important kind of non-community to think about, and that is the cult or the cult-like group. 
many years ago while serving in a small town in a clergy role in a progressive congregation, some of the women um, in that area who had been in what I described as cults figured out that I was someone they could talk to as they were figuring out how to separate from their cult. Uh, it was an amazing time to listen. Um, by listening, I learned a lot about how cults operate on an individual. Power and control are definitely factored. One's life is limited by the rules and authority figures in the groups. For instance, one woman talked about how she was, for the first 20 years she had been married, never allowed to cook with what she called a ready mix, a cake mix, a prepared stuffing mix, anything that wasn't made from scratch. And so she spent a lot of her day preparing meals. She had an intense sense of an in-group um, with everyone not in the in-group being both outside of that group and in some sense evil. So the same woman described how she had raised her children in this cult. And now that she was leaving, she was not permitted by her children to see her grandchildren. She was leaving because she had begun to recognize the control over how she behaved. And, and she had begun to recognize that she wanted more choices in her life to make herself. And yet she was considering going back because she was not sure she could bear never seeing her grandchildren again. Such groups, as many have pointed out, generally start as ways to support each other against an external threat. In her cult's case, that threat was the evil of the outside world, temptation. And being a religious cult, it promised great rewards for being part of the group, like eternal life. Gangs and cults operate on the same kind of us-them division as Grand Falloons do, but in a much more exaggerated and I would say destructive way. When I lived in Chicago for 20 years, I lived near a high school, just two blocks away. When I'd meet people like at work or in community organizations who said they had gone to that high school, I learned to ask them, about the gang wars at the school in their time. In the 50s, there were Jewish and Gentile gangs, later Hispanic and Anglo, for a time black and white. In my time living there, the Chinese and Vietnamese gangs were stabbing each other. All of these gangs, notice, were actually organized around ethnicities who were defining themselves against another ethnicity. Sapolsky's um, in and out groups, but with a lot more danger than the Daughters of the American Revolution. Unlike Grand Falloons and pseudo community, in cults and gangs and similar groups, leaving is very difficult. In fact, differing is difficult. Asserting individuality is difficult. That can, for those who stay, actually magnify the sense of belonging so much that it is worth the terrible costs that accompany such obedience. Chris Hedges, in writing about cults, both religious and political, said this, all cults are personality cults. All cults are really extensions of whoever the cult leader is. So whatever the prejudices, the worldview, and the ideas of the cult leader are, they will be chanted back at him by the crowd. Until massive social and economic inequality, as well as the betrayal of the country by the elite, are confronted and remedied, this yearning for a cult leader will not go away. Desperate people are looking for somebody to save them. That's Chris Hedges. And the pattern is similar to other abusive relationships. Sarah Edmondson wrote, one of the things that can be helpful in terms of an explanation is to look at the ways in which cults are similar to abusive relationships. Nobody seeks out an abusive partner 
But so many people stay in these relationships longer than they should. They make excuses, they ignore red flags, and they allow themselves to be emotionally manipulated. Sarah Edmondson is an actress who got involved in the recent, and I, I know there's a way to pronounce it, but the NXIVM, secretive self-improvement cult. She was a key whistleblower in exposing the cult. If you have never been in an abusive relationship, you might think it is easy to leave. But if you've ever really listened to those who've been in such a relationship or found yourself in one, you know that leaving is not so easy. It's the same thing with cults. Heather Marsh, author of a book called The Creation of Me, Them, and Us, called these kinds of groups endo groups. A key feature, she says, with every endo group is the perception that the in-group faces an existential external threat, one that threatens their very existence. She points out that our counterbalance to these is the also human tendency towards mutuality and egalitarianism, which she says can dismantle any endogroup power structure when there isn't a perceived emergency. That is why a group like QAnon can exist and feel like a strong in-group, despite most members never meeting each other. There are perceived emergencies. One of them is that Democrats eat children. But of course, you aren't introduced to that idea as a first step. Instead, legitimate fears of large organizations and of abusive state power are exaggerated and used to get someone into a state of hypervigilant fear. And then you share this set of secrets and the perception that the outside world is rid ridiculing your beliefs builds even stronger bonds with those inside. Even that QAnon basic theory about eating children mirrors an ancient conspiracy theory used to demonize Jews and allow great violence to be done to them from medieval times through the Holocaust. I think it would be a mistake to think that any of us is immune to the appeal of these false communities given the right circumstances. Another cult expert Alexander Stein writes, it is in fact a healthy response to atomization to seek to join up with others. As humans, we are social animals. We have a fundamental need to join with others to seek solutions to the problems of survival. The danger arises if in that effort, one encounters a totalist group that seeks to isolate and control its members then one's own survival and potentially that of others is put at gravest risk. We know the warning signs of grand falloons, of pseudo community and of cults or gangs. Assuming agreement that is not there and enforcing tight agreement on the basis of the authority of some person, those are two of the key signs that it's not real community. A true community has conflict within it and handles it creatively. A true community may have boundaries, but not boundaries that define everybody inside as good and everybody outside as evil. Building beloved community is a lot harder uh, in so many ways than fleeing to these different kinds of false communities. In the need to belong, it can be easier to get all the answers, to not question, to let authorities tell us what is true. And yet those moments of real community, if we are fortunate enough to feel them, can be liberating. The women I talked to about their cult experiences, they were still looking for community that could fulfill their sense of belonging while still allowing themselves to be their individual selves. Would they find it? Or like many in abusive relationships, would they settle for another abusive relationship? Bessel van der Kolk, who writes about trauma, also talks about how people who have experienced trauma 
may seek the affirmation they find in such groups and points out that people then turn out not to find what they need there. He writes, gangs, extremist political parties, and religious cults may provide solace, but they rarely foster the mental flexibility needed to be fully open to what life has to offer. And as such, they cannot liberate their members from their traumas. Well-functioning people are able to accept individual differences and acknowledge the humanity of others. So the bottom line for me is that latter, accepting individual differences and acknowledging the humanity of others. Beloved community is where we are each recognized as individuals, where the common humanity of others is recognized, not just within the boundaries of our group. Those who cannot, it's also true that in beloved community, the boundary and community is defined by those who can practice that. Those who cannot see others as individuals, but only as objects who are good or evil. Those who cannot recognize the common humanity of others, they're not yet ready for beloved community. And a community can be destroyed by their active presence within the community. When I say that healthy communities also have boundaries, I think that's the basic definition of those boundaries. A community might have some other sense of purpose or uniting characteristic beyond just being a community of difference. For an ethical society, for instance, it's people who put ethical living at the center of what we might call the spiritual or religious or life stance quest. Whether or not we also have metaphysical beliefs about whether gods exist. But if we are to be an authentic community, not a grand falloon or a cult, we accept that others who have other centers for their living are still human beings, not to be treated as subhuman. And within our community, recognizing that the differences and conflicts we have are how we learn from each other. It's why we practice the art of listening for understanding, not for agreement. Reminding ourselves that it's not just what we hold in common that makes us community. It's also our respect for what we are hold in difference. At times in our life, we may find groups that are able to be authentic community. No groups are perfect all the time, just as no person in a relationship acts perfectly all the time. If we think they do, um, we're probably in that early forming stage where we don't look too deep. And yet we do see in our lives glimpses of how community can help or heal. So I'll close with this call from Scott Peck, whose term pseudo community I borrowed today. He wrote, we know the rules of community. We know the healing effect of community in terms of individual lives. If we could somehow find a way across the bridge of our knowledge, would not these same rules have a healing effect upon our world? We human beings have often been referred to as social animals, but we are not yet community creatures. We are impelled to relate with each other for our survival, but we do not yet relate with the inclusivity, realism, self-awareness, vulnerability, commitment, openness, freedom, equality, and love of genuine community. It is clearly no longer enough to be simply social animals, babbling together at cocktail parties and brawling with each other in business and over boundaries. It is our task, our essential, central, crucial task to transform ourselves from mere social creatures into community creatures. It is the only way that human evolution will be able to proceed. So we'll say goodbye now to those joining us on video. Come join us another Sunday, usually at 11 a.m. Find out more about us at ryscc.org.
Next Sunday, we'll be talking about commitments, saying yes and saying no.